Lord be with you and also with you. You're most welcome this morning. Very good morning to you all. Uh, a good day uh, if you're watching this a bit later in the day or, or later in the week evening. Uh, but whether you are a parishioner at St. Common else here or at Portland on Parish uh, or from outside these parishes, you're, you're most welcome to be with us. This is Sunday the 28th of February. This Sunday marks the second Sunday of Lent. Uh, as part of Lent, uh, we all know we're on the path towards Easter, towards the cross. Um, thankfully now, given uh, the latest restrictions, it does look like, God willing, uh, we are preparing to open again uh, for Easter. Uh, really from Good Friday onwards, uh, it looks like we will have permission to meet again in person. So we are planning uh, services uh, beginning on the evening of Good Friday. Uh, we can't do a normal full Holy Week like we'd, uh, we'd, like we'd prefer to, but that's not possible. So from Friday the 2nd of April, you'll see on screen, uh, we'll be meeting here at St. Colmenel's at 8 p.m. for a service, Good Friday service. And then on Easter Sunday, uh, we'll have services in both churches uh, at uh, 10 a.m. in Portland on Parish Hall and 11.30 a.m. here in St. Colman Hills. Now to date we have not been uh, taking bookings uh, uh, during this time uh, and thankfully we've not had to turn anyone away although the attendance has been great. Uh, but for these three services because it's Easter um, because we haven't been meeting together in person for uh, a good while uh, we think it best that we uh, collect bookings uh, for these three services. So you'll, you'll need to contact me basically if you'd like to book a place. Uh, my phone number, uh, my email address is on screen there so you can phone or text me even or email me uh, to let me know and we'll make sure that there's space for you. So it's good news anyway that we have a, a date to work towards and uh, God willing uh, we will be in a place where when we get to that point we can all move on uh, and try and move back to something we're all a bit more familiar with. That's the hope uh, and that should be our prayer, of course. Uh, being the second Sunday of Lent, uh, there's a, a, a gospel passage from uh, Mark chapter 8. Uh, and in that there's a line Jesus says, For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospels will save it. That we pass it as Mark chapter 8, verse 35. Jen and I were recently uh, on a walk with Bob, uh, and it's great to see that there's a bit of blue sky uh, around at the minute, so we can enjoy our walks a bit more. But uh, we came across this path, you'll see it on screen, uh, that really blocked us. Uh, there was a short stretch, and the entire path was muddy. There was no wee stretches, no wee dry bits on either side where we could walk around. Uh, so there was nothing we could do but to walk through it. Jen and I had to look at each other, look at her feet, uh, shrug her shoulders and just go ahead and ply on through. Otherwise we wouldn't have been able to, to finish the walk or stay on the path. It was a case of, uh, just like life is sometimes, the way out is through. The way out is through. A lot of us in these current times are, are not seeing in our path, are not seeing a wee dry bit around the side, around the edges that we can escape what we have to go through, uh, what we're facing. And it can be not pretty for us at the minute. And many of us are having to say, we just have to get through this. We have to, the way out for us is through. Jesus on the way to the cross, uh, at that point from, from Mark chapter 8, um, is telling his disciples, starting to tell his disciples that the cross is what is ahead for him. He's telling them that he is going to have to suffer. He has difficult times and extreme ahead. And his disciples in response to this are naturally saying, no Lord, surely no, this shouldn't happen. There's a way around this. You shouldn't have to go through this. Jesus' response to that is basically to say, don't tempt me. The cross is on my path and it's what I must do. And he reminds them at that point, as he reminds us, each of us followers, each of us on the Christian path, he reminds us that it's a difficult path and it's not always easy. And if we turn away from those difficulties, if we say to ourselves, I want a comfortable life, I don't want to face this, 
uh, instead of living for Christ, then we are in danger of losing it. But whoever loses his life, whoever lets go, whoever gives, gives up the comforts and the security and presses on through the mud on their Christian path will save it. Let's pray. Lord God, as we gather today together online, uh, maybe we are at a point in our lives where all we see is the challenges or the burdens that are ahead for us. Or we're at a point where we are challenged to follow you even at all. Maybe we're at a point where we want to turn back and go a different direction. And in doing so, turn away from you. Lord God, help each of us today, this very day, embrace our relationship with you. Embrace even the challenges of the life that is before us with our hearts turned to you. Lord, help us to look to you and to worship you now in whatever circumstances we're in. Help us praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, our opening hymn this morning is Ancient of Days. Within that we uh, hymn, there's a few lines. One that says, Though the dread of night overwhelm my soul, here, he is here with me. I am not alone. The Lord God Almighty is with us. Uh, the Ancient of Days can be someone we call upon. Let's worship him now. Oh 
And now we are reminded uh, why we come together, uh, the purpose we come together uh, to worship together. Beloved in Christ. Beloved in Christ, we come together to offer to Almighty God our worship and our praise and our thanksgiving. To confess our sins and to receive God's forgiveness. To hear his holy word proclaimed. To bring before him our needs and the needs of the world. And to pray that in the power of his spirit we may serve him and know the greatness of his love. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. We say together, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed. Through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. By what we have done and by what we have failed to do, we are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our collect for today, this is the second Sunday in Lent. Almighty God, you show to those who are in error the light of your truth, that they may return to the way of righteousness. Grant to all those who are admitted into the fellowship of Christ's religion, that they may reject those things that are contrary to their profession and follow all such things as are agreeable to the same. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We are finishing our journey through uh, Daniel today. We're at Daniel chapter 7. Uh, and Gordon is going to preach for us now uh, later in the service, so we look forward to that. But firstly, uh, we are thankful to Donna, uh, who brings us our Bible reading. Today's reading is from Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 to 14. Earlier during the first year of King Belshazzar's reign in Babylon, Daniel had a dream and saw visions as he lay in his bed. He wrote down the dream and this is what he saw. In my vision that night, I, Daniel, saw a great storm churning the surface of the great sea with strong winds blowing from every direction. Then four huge beasts came up out of the water, each different from the others. The first beast was like a lion with eagle's wings. As I watched its wings were pulled off, and it was left standing on its two hind feet on the ground, like a human being, and it was given a human mind. Then I saw a second beast, and it looked like a bear. It was rearing up on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and I heard a voice saying to it, Get up, devour the flesh of many people. Then the third of these strange beasts appeared, and it looked like a leopard. It had four birds' wings on its back, and it had four heads. Great authority was given to this beast. Then in my vision that night I saw a fourth beast, terrifying, dreadful and very strong. It devoured and crushed its victims with huge iron teeth and trampled their remains beneath its feet. It was different from any other of the beasts and it had ten horns. As I was looking at the horns, suddenly another small horn appeared among them. Three of the first horns were torn out by the roots to make room for, the, for it. This little horn had eyes like human eyes and a mouth that was boasting arrogantly. I watched as thrones were put in place and the Ancient One sat down to judge. His clothing was as white as snow, his hair like purest wool. He sat on a fiery throne with wheels of blazing fire and a river of fire was pouring out, flowing from his presence. Millions of angels ministered to him, many millions stood to attend him. Then the courts began its session and the books were opened. I continued to watch because I could hear the little horn's boastful speech. I kept watching until the fourth beast was killed and its body was destroyed by fire. The other three beasts had their authority taken from them, but they were allowed to live a while longer. 
As my vision continued that night, I saw someone like a son of man coming with clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient One and was led into his presence. He was given authority, honour and sovereignty over all the nations of the world so that people of every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal, it will never end, his kingdom will never be destroyed. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. So for the past six weeks we have looked at stories from the book of Daniel. Stories about Daniel and his friends living in exile in the royal court in Babylon. Now these stories are very entertaining and are always popular and memorable from our Sunday school times. But they also have a serious purpose about how to live in a foreign cut land as a minority yet still remain faithful to God. So in our secular world These stories help us to understand how to live when our belief in Jesus Christ places us at the margins of society. So we've completed chapters 1 to 6 of Daniel and now we come to chapter 7. And when we read chapter 7 it feels like we've entered a different world. Chapter 7 and indeed the rest of the book of Daniel is made up of strange visions. And these visions are confusing because they're full of images and symbols and ideas that come from the time when the book of Daniel was written. And these symbols can mean little or nothing to us today. And because these visions and symbols and images are so different and because they appear so cryptic to us, they have been abused a lot. Along with the book of Revelation, Daniel 7 to 12 is probably the most interpreted, sorry, the most misinterpreted part of the Bible. So often the symbols and images in Daniel and Revelation, they're pulled apart, they're mashed up, and they're thrown together again and turned into a list of events that have to happen before Jesus returns. Our scriptures are twisted to to explain today's events as part of an end times countdown to a final judgment. And a good example of this scriptural twisting comes only from 10 years ago. Because in 2011, a radio broadcaster called Harold Camping calculated that based on the numbers in the books of Daniel and Revelation, that Jesus would return on the 21st of May of that year, 2011. In response to hearing this, Thousands of very well-meaning people sold their houses and gave up their jobs to go onto the streets and tell everybody they could about Jesus' return. But after the 21st of May came and went, there was no change. And the only thing the media broadcasted was the anger, the despair, the frustration that many of these good people experienced as they tried to rebuild their lives. So this is an example of a bad reading of scripture. And we can see that bad readings can really hurt people. I know of too many people who have come across this ever-changing end time speculation. And because of, because of it, have either left the faith or have been left jaded and falter in their walk with God. I believe Jesus will return. I really do believe it. But scripture is very clear. We don't know when and we don't know how. So engaging in speculation about Jesus' return is not only a waste of time, but it is wrong. A multitude of Christians' lives are wasted on such conjecture. And the internet age we live in now has only widened the number of end end times conspiracy theories that turn up. But these are based more on what people see in the television or in movies or on news channels than what the Bible is actually saying. Now I have found that when I try to have a conversation with some people who believe in such speculations, these things have a strong hold on them. And they're unwilling to discuss alternative, perhaps better readings. It seems more like a paranoia than a belief system. 
There is a fear that someone will change their mind, even when their views are based on logic de defying leaps of imagination. Now, am I being too harsh here? I don't think so. I don't think so because this misinterpretation of scripture has an effect of, on people. People who believe these things often are indifferent to the suffering of others because they just see them as a working out of uh, end times. One church leader suggests that prayer is needed when trying to encourage such people to imagine that there are better ways to read the Bible. Because these so-called end times worldviews can really mess you up. So if this is a bad way to read Daniel 7, how should we approach it? Is there a better alternative? I believe there is. When we read Daniel 7, we don't read it as if we're reading a newspaper. Instead, it is a type of literature that uses imagery and symbols to try and provide something like a view of events from a heavenly perspective. It is revealing, it is revealing something of God's perspective on events, events now or in the future. But its purpose is to be an encouragement to believers who are living in times of crisis. It is for persecuted believers in need of hope it is for people who are asking questions like, where is God in our strife and in our misery? So the aim of this literature is to bring hope. God is reminding his people that he is still in charge. He is still in charge and will put things to right. So Daniel's dream begins with a strange, with these strange hybrid animals coming out of the sea. And the sea in the ancient world is a symbol of a place where God's rule is challenged by chaotic forces. So it is significant that these great beasts come out of the deep. These beasts represent four arrogant kingdoms or empires in the ancient world that are engaged in anti-God activities. The first three beasts are strange enough, but the fourth beast is seen as the stuff of nightmares. If you've watched the Netflix series Stranger Things, you'll understand how this sort of imagery is at the borders of our reality. But even this fourth beast, fourth beast is not the focus of the problem. The focus moves in to the beast's ten horns, and then we zoom down even further into this one smaller boastful horn who represents a king of the fourth kingdom. The vision then switches from what is happening on earth to what is happening in heaven. And the first scene is one of God's heavenly court. And this ancient of days, God himself presiding in judgment over the boastful king. Then the second scene is an enthronement where instead of the little horn in power, someone like a son of man approaches the throne and is given authority over all the nations who in turn will worship him. Again, we need to remember why this is written. It is written to comfort people in hard times. And comfort is needed because Daniel 7 predicts that some of the people of God will be handed over to this boastful king for a period of time. Persecution is a reality for God's people. But what persecution is Daniel seeing here? Who is this king or this kingdom that is connected to the little horn that is so boastful? Now, everyone on the internet has their opinions. Was this king the Roman Empire? Or is it the Roman Catholic Church? Or is it the British Empire? Or is it the European Union or Russia or Iran? With every changing news item, some people decide to theorize as to what kingdom Daniel is talking about. But there is a false assumption here. False assumption to all these theories. And the false assumption is that this passage, like others in Daniel, is talking about events after the incarnation of Jesus 2,000 years ago. It is talking about persecution to the church. But it seems pretty clear that the people of God that Daniel is talking about is the Jewish people. 
It's written in the Old Testament before the incarnation of Jesus. So when we look at Daniel 7, we need to look to the past to find this persecution and not the future. In verses 24 and 25 of Daniel 7, we read this. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people and try to change the set times and the laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times and half a time. This is talking about the, the boastful horn, this boastful king. And in the time between Daniel and Jesus, there is one person who fits this, per, this, this picture, this image precisely. And that's the Greek king Antiochus Epiphanes. He is the first great, great Greek king to boast of himself as a god. He even stamped this on every coin minted in his reign. The reverse of every coin of his reign says, King Antiochus, God manifest, bearing victory. Now, if you ask me, this is pretty boastful, as you set yourself up in comparison to the true God. But Antiochus is especially remembered for his persecution of the Jewish people. And in 167 BC, because of internal Jewish strife, Antiochus sacked Jerusalem. He massacred tens of thousands of Jewish people and enslaved tens of thousands more. Antiochus banned Jewish religious rites and traditions, like keeping the Sabbath and circumcision. And as a result, he eventually ordered the worship of the Greek god Zeus in the very temple where the Jewish god, our god, was present. This is the abomination of desolation. If we look at Daniel 9, it's what Daniel 9 talks about. And as a response to this, in the same year, the Jewish people rose up against Antiochus under a family that became known as the Maccabees. So if Antiochus is the boastful little horn of the beast, what happens? Well, in the vision, the little horn is brought low. God has sat in judgment and the horn will be defeated. Verse 11 states, the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. Three years after this attack on Jerusalem, in 164 BC, Antiochus dies. And by this year, the Jewish people are well on their way to, to freedom, freedom from rule from any foreign empire. And it seems that the vision in verse 25 as we have read, has been correct in predicting that it's a period of persecution for about two or three years, after which God will set things to rights. The Jewish people have their own kingdom again. And for the Jewish people, the story seems to have ended in victory. But this isn't the end of the story. Because this kingdom of the Jewish people only lasts for about a hundred years. They have got rid of foreign tyrants, like Antiochus. But their own kings, and their, even their own high priests, become tyrants in their own right. In a short time, the next big empire, Rome, arrives in the scene, and the Jewish people are again controlled by a foreign nation. So when the Jewish people look back to their scriptures and, and back to Daniel, is this vision a false vision? Is it, should it be seen as part of scripture? Can God be trusted with his promises? To answer this, we have to go again to the end of the vision. And we read from verse 13. In my vision that night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And then in verse 27, Daniel receives this, this verse's interpretation. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. 
His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all rulers will worship and obey him. We see the point of this vision, the end point of this vision is not about judgment and the end of Antiochus, nor is it even about the freedom of God's people. That is a result of what the vision is about. Instead, it's about the coming of a person who is like the Son of Man. And this means that there is a person like a human being who comes and is brought before God. And then God gives to him all earthly authority. And not just that, but strangely, he is worshipped. So who is this strange character who has arisen in the middle of Daniel's vision in chapter 7? It is almost as if this person is being enthroned by God to rule as God himself rules. And this is exactly what it is. The vision is of an enthronement ceremony. And the king now comes to take his throne to rule over all of God's creation. Who will this be? Well, of course, when we look at the Gospels, we see that it's Jesus. Jesus never consciously used the title Christ about himself. And the, but the one term he consistently used to describe himself is this Son of Man. He connects himself to Daniel's vision as the Son of Man. And he is given universal authority by God the Father. He rules over everything. But this type of rule is something very different than the expectations of the time. Because the Son of Man is not a military leader like the Maccabees. His rule is very different. He doesn't send armies like Antiochus, maiming and destroying. Rather, he sends his disciples out to proclaim his kingship to the nations with a message about a kingdom that sounds very much like the words in Daniel in verse 27. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all people and all rulers will worship and obey him. So Daniel's vision is not about the second coming of Jesus. It is about his first coming, his incarnation in Bethlehem and his impact about all the nations in the, in the 2000 years since and in the future. When we only look at the return of Jesus in the future, we fail to see that the kingdom began with the coming of Jesus and it is one which has not disappeared. We are testimony to that. And it will not disappear. It has not disappeared and it will not disappear. Now many end time speculators think the kingdom of God will only come as a vengeful mighty army of angels destroying those who are against Jesus. But Jesus explains in parables that God's kingdom is very different. It is like a seed which starts to grow unseen until it sprouts and becomes a great plant. And in history, God's kingdom in the church starts as a small group of faithful people who are encountering different, difficult times again, but they persevere and endure. For Jesus and for his disciples, it's a kingdom that thrives on love, compassion, kindness, gentleness, and peace. That is what the kingdom is like. And what it will be like when Jesus comes again. That is a promise to us in the hardest of times, when our faithfulness is challenged by the events that surround us. It is also a fact that this kingdom is one which has already spread right around the world. It has citizens in every nation. Because there are no borders to this kingdom, it has infiltrated every nation in the world, even those that have tried to keep it out. Because in Iran, in North Korea, in China, in Pakistan, everywhere, everywhere in this world, the church is growing in the power of the Holy Spirit. If we believe this message of Daniel, that the eternal kingdom has come, if we believe we are a part of it, we need not be ashamed to tell others about it. This vision is not just about our future. It's about the fact that the end times didn't, don't begin now or a thousand years ahead, but they began when Jesus first turned up as a baby in Bethlehem. 
That is the turning point of history. The turning point of history occurred in Bethlehem and Golgotha. True, the final victory is in the future. We don't know when, and we unfortunately don't know when this veil of tears will end. But the New Testament does explain some of what our future resurrected life will be like in the fullness of the kingdom. And it is a life free from suffering and full of blessing. And it is important that we know this so that we hold on to this future hope. That the pain of today is not eternal. But the kingdom is here now. It's here now as well. And Jesus, as the Son of Man, is enthroned. And he's enthroned on the cross. That is who our King is. It is the resurrection of Jesus that gives us hope that no ruler or authority or power has any ability to destroy this kingdom. Because Jesus has, been, has risen from the dead. And the life-giving Holy Spirit is the power behind this kingdom that no other authority can stand against. But it starts quietly. Think of where you have been in your own life and how Jesus has transformed you and how he's transforming you today. Because that is the end of Daniel's vision coming to life in our lives. Because of Jesus, we have been included in God's people. And whether in the near or the distant future, we have the hope that when Jesus does return, he will bring us to him. This is where I think a better reading of Daniel's vision brings us to. It brings us to Jesus today. He is coming today when all will be made new and when all will be made right. So we don't dismiss the past or the future, but we follow Jesus in the present. And right here, right now, he is present. He is present here with his people in the power of the Holy Spirit. He has not forgotten us, even though it's hard times. And he invites us to continue and endure and to follow in his way until we see his eternal kingdom. I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, you are too immense for us to understand you by our own abilities. Yet you have given us the scriptures to reveal yourself to us. And Father, this is a difficult book sometimes. But help us to take seriously the straightforward parts. Help us to be humble in our understanding when it comes to the harder parts. But most of all, help us to see Jesus in these words. Without trying to use him for our own benefit. Instead, help us to worship him right. And to sit under his teaching. In the name of our King and Saviour Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let us pray together. We begin with the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our response in our prayers to Lord in your mercy is hear our prayers. Lord in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we pray for our church. The worldwide church is supposed to stand up for you and hold the name of Jesus as Lord and Saviour up high above everything else. There are Churches in some of the most difficult parts of this world that do that at great risk, great risk of violence, great risk of persecution. There are churches in this world also that hold back from holding your name high 
or you hold up a, a wordly or a safe or watered down gimmicky version of the gospel. Just so no offense is called, Lord, may the worldwide church grow in spite of persecution. May it grow in spite of the temptation to play it safe, to dumb the message down. May it grow through the challenging and saving message of the gospel of Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our broken society. Although many of us have experienced a safe and good home and caring families for some of us and for many throughout the world, that was not and is not the case. Lord, where young people receive little compassion or guidance or discipline, Lord, where old people are ignored or neglected. We have a society, Lord, many times of individuals far too often who care for their own freedom to do what they please. And this can result in broken lives, broken homes and broken promises. Lord, we pray for healing. We pray for turning back to worshipping you. We pray for people to find a true hope and a true direction and a true meaning in their lives by living a life with Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we continue to pray for our health care system, for those who are fighting and have been doing so for so long now against this challenge and virus working demanding hours uh, in demanding circumstances under both physical and emotional strain. Lord, we ask that you are with them. Bring them strength and comfort. Bring them uh, resilience and rest. Give to all who care for others in this world, Lord, we pray, a true sense of their own value and the importance of the godly work they can do. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray as well, Lord, for anyone who we know who are ill at the moment. We bring to mind, now in a moment's silence, those who are known to us and who are in need of your healing hand. Lord, when we fall ill, sometimes we recover quickly and go back to full strength. Sometimes it can be very slow and we can just gather again part of our full strength. And sometimes there are those who will never recover. We ask, Lord, for your grace and your compassion on all who are unwell. Help us all to know that our health is a, a real gift in life and one to be thankful for in a daily way. And may our relationship with you, Lord God, be the most healthy thing that we pursue in this world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And lastly, we close our prayers by praying uh, for each other, or for each of us, uh, the morning prayer collect. Go before us, Lord, in all our doings with your most gracious favour and further us with your continual help that in all our works begun, continued and ended anew, we may glorify your holy name and finally, by your mercy, attain everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A final blessing. Uh, the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Our closing hymn now is He Will Hold Me Fast.
I thank you again for, for joining us this morning. And as I say often, uh, let me know if you or anyone uh, has any pastoral need uh, where you would like my assistance. So please contact me for that if needs be. So as we close now, I invite you all just to go in peace, to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. <laughs>